So climate-based art modelling, the what, the why and the how, part one, which is me, Eleonora, is part two. Um, <coughs> the what, we can dispatch very quickly. This is climate-based light modelling. Prediction of any luminous quantity using realistic sun and sky conditions derived from standardised or monitored climate data and usually for a full year. Um, the why, um, that is why. Uh, so we can predict uh, met quantities, metrics for non-overcast sky conditions. Uh, prior to 2013, that was largely an academic exercise, but of course, since the EFA um, decision to make climate-based a mandatory requirement um, for the Priority Schools Building Programme, now there is a, a definite reason why we want to do climate-based alert modelling, whether or not we like it. Um, everything that follows in mine, and certainly in Eleanor's, it will be about the how. So every slide from now on, the how. Um, so let's remind ourselves first of the sky. Um, unfortunately, this sky, like all the skies you'll see, is oval, because uh, we couldn't get it to do four by three. You know, it's bad enough watching a great movie like this, but uh, anyway, we'll just have to live with this. So diffuse horizontal illuminance, that's all the light energy from the sky, uh, with the sun, if it's there, blocked off, arriving in the horizontal. The direct normal illuminance is the light energy visible light energy uh, arriving on a photocell that's pointing normal to the direction of the sun and the tracking device usually has an acceptance angle of six degrees with a flat response across that. The uh, angle of the uh, sun is actually only 0.5 degrees but uh, it'd be a bit of a tall order to have a device track just that and nothing else. So it's just standardized on six degrees and if there is sun there you also get a bit of circumsolar brightness will contribute to the to the direct normal but it's not a big thing um, <coughs> now those are the basis of the values that we need from a standardized climate file to drive a climate-based simulation so we just take our 8760 hourly values and reorder them to 24 by 365 and then false color each hour by some uh, using some scheme scheme here shown in the legend 0 to 60,000 lux so night time, we've shaded grey, and here is January the 1st, thin line up there, small, short day in the winter, longer day in the summer. And we're seeing the uh, seasonal pattern and indeed the hour by hour variation, more conspicuous in the direct normal illuminance there. Um, <coughs> now, of course, that pattern will never repeat in precisely that way. It's not always gonna be sunny in June the 20th in Nottingham and so forth. It's a standardised file. It's compiled from many years' observations and it will take months from different years that are that have been statistically shown to be representative of something like 95% of the variation that you get. What you won't have is the very extreme conditions. Um, they actually are treated separately and used to compile uh, what in the UK is called a design summer year, which is used to kind of stress test HVAC systems and so forth. Okay, so that's our, our basic climate data. So we've got um, half of 8,760, 4,380 or so hours of daylight in the year. Um, and we've got hundreds of these climate files freely available. Um, previous one you saw was SIBSI one, which I believe are licensed. Um, these are the ones Energy Plus uh, on the Energy Plus website. And indeed for the UK, we can see we've got a smattering of them uh, from London to Aberdeen, Norwich, London, Manchester and so forth. Um, these files, of course, were compiled for dynamic thermal simulation, not for lighting simulation, but they contain the quantities that we need for uh, climate based daylight modelling. The sky brightness distribution, we generate that from our values, hour by hour values in the climate data. If there's no direct normal contribution at all, then we'll assume it's probably an overcast sky and generate an overcast sky distribution. If it's very clear sky conditions, which we can tell from the 
say something like the Perez Clearness Index, then we might want to generate a clear sky distribution, and indeed we can make composites of these. These, of course, are uh, idealizations. You cannot reproduce instantaneous cloud patterns and things like that from hourly data. But they show you the prevailing nature of the uh, illumination conditions that you can estimate from your climate file. So the easiest, well, the easiest, the most straightforward way of doing climate-based modelling is brute force. Just take your climate data at every hour, determine what the sun and sky conditions are, and then run a lighting simulation program, say Radiance, and repeat for all 4,380 daylight hours, and of course be prepared to wait yeah, quite a while. <coughs> a much more efficient approach is daylight coefficients. Um, it's much more efficient to carry out climate-based daylight modelling with daylight coefficients because we break up the sky into patches and treat each patch independently. So say we have n patches, we compute the illuminance contribution from each one of those and then derive the illuminance resulting from arbitrary sky and sun patterns from those pre-computed values. So then we're doing very quick arithmetic on pre-computed values. Yeah. Very quick arithmetic, we're not doing lighting simulation which can be CPU intensive and can take a while. And at worst, the computational cost is the number of patches times that for a one-off standard daylight simulation using radiance, either overcast or sun and sky, whichever. Yeah. <coughs> Now the principle of daylight coefficients, and it's a wonderful, wonderfully elegant, simple little uh, principle, is that relate this, if we've got some sort of illuminate, some form of illumination out there, let's just say it's a light bulb, brightness B, and it's illuminating a point inside this space, and we're getting an illuminance E from that bulb B. And it can be arriving directly or indirectly. And this, I should mention, this idea was uh, first proposed by Tregenza and Waters in 1983. Now, if we double the brightness of that bulb, then we're going to get double the illumination here. Straightforward relationship. So instead of a bulb, we have a patch of sky. And we'll divide up the sky so the whole hemisphere is divided up into these mostly rectangular patches. And they'll come comprise the complete hemisphere. The patch will have a luminance. The alpha and the gamma refer to its uh, altitude and azimuth angles. There will be a solid angle subtended at this point here by the, um, by the patch of sky. And that patch there will produce an illumination delta E at this point in the space. And that can arrive, just like the bulb we've shown, directly or indirectly from reflections both outside and inside the space. Now the quantity that we derive, the daylight coefficient, is simply the illumination contribution divided by the patch luminance times the patch solid angle. And we compute that value and then we calculate this and we save it. The patch scheme that we use is nearly always the 145 Tregenza scheme. So this was devised by Tregenza, I think, in the year just before the International Daylight Measurement Program, when they were looking for a patch scheme that would work with sky scanning devices. Yeah, so it's divide up the sky. And here you can fit in an 11 degree solid angle in each of these. Uh, so you'll, uh, you'll see that in the next slide. So 145 patches. Um, here it is sort of shown laid out in a projection. Here, it's, here you see it in sort of 3D. So um, the way we'll approach daylight coefficients with radiance, our first thoughts of doing this, what we call the, the straightforward, the naive approach here, is we create 145 source solid angles. These are our patches using the radiance material light. So this is a self-luminous material 
which will be sampled deterministically by the radiant stimulation. Um, and then for each patch in turn, we do our lighting simulation and we store the results. And we just need to apply a little bit of correction for the missing solid angle because we want to have complete coverage of the whole hemisphere. Yes, we call this the naive daylight coefficient formulation. So here's our bit we need to correct for, so we just scale our amount by that missing bit of, of solid angle there. Um, the example that we use is the BRE uh, room. Uh, so this is based on a room which was around in 1992. I'm sure it's still there. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Up there, Building 9, was it? Building 9. Uh, it's, it's a nine metre deep room and photocells, six photocells spread out along it. Um, and we're using this room because directly above the room, on the top of that building, we're measuring instruments that are recording the sky brightness distribution, as well as a lot of other quantities. So we've got actually a complete description of the luminous environment um, for validation purposes. So we'll predict the, illumin the illuminance at each point in here um, from each patch of sky in turn, using that equation. And, oh sorry, there's a photo of the room. And here's what the daylight coefficients look like at each of the different photocell points. Now hopefully you can get some sort of sense that there's clearly, you're seeing the window here and it's getting smaller and smaller because that's the the, s the highest daylight coefficients, which is shaded bright yellow, are the direct view of the sky through the window. It's shifted over a little bit here because the room is actually a little bit west of, west of south. And I notice there's four orders of magnitude here in the daylight coefficient value. So we're predicting this, this quantity here, so for at each patch in turn for, for those, six, those six photocells. And we've got all these values and we'll store them and use them to predict illumination. Okay, so to compute the illuminance due to sky, so for one particular sky condition, this example happens to be clear sky, we'll get our distribution from the clear sky distribution for the, um, for the C uh, CIE sky. So we'll have absolute values of luminance at each patch. We know the solid angle of each patch and we've computed the daylight coefficient at each point in the room for each patch on the sky. And we just need to do a numerical sum. So again, it's just arithmetic, which is very fast. So we have our daylight coefficient matrix. This is the one for photocell one, multiplied by sky luminance. So what I actually get is an average value in each of these um, patch patches. multiplied by the vector for solid angle. That just looks a little bit like that because it varies slightly from patch to patch as it changes the number of <coughs> patches in each row. So for any given sky luminance pattern like this, where we've got an absolute value in each of these, we compute the luminance at that point where, say for that patch, we take that patch, multiply it by that one and that one, and then add it to the product of that one, next one along, and so forth, and do that for all of them. Sure. So that's um, this average that for all the clear sky days of the Oh, no, 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 that's just a one-off. That's just one instantaneous, one instantaneous. And what would actually happen, I've shown the continuous distribution, is the actual value that's used in the daylight coefficient evaluation would be the average luminance in that patch. Yeah, I mean, any burning question, do sort of throw it in while, while we go. Now, that's for the sky. To compute the, um, the sun contribution, we'd use that same daylight coefficient, but now we'd use the solid angle for the sun and the luminance of the sun, which could be actually 10 to the 9, something like that, yeah, if it's very clear sun. And we use the patch centre, which is nearest to the sun. So we've got our sun position, happens to be somewhere there, so we'll, that'll be our patch centre. So we'll use that patch. And we'll add 
that illuminance vector of the six values, the six photocells, to the illuminance for the sky, and then we've got our illuminance at that instant in time from the sun and the sky. And then we can do this again and again and again for every sky in our climate data file. Um, it's worth noting that when we're doing this with the sun, the sun could actually be seven degrees or so away from the actual patch centre which we're using. Um, now with a source solid angle and material type light, Radiance uses a single ray to source that. And so whilst we've got our daylight coefficients and we could do run through a climate data file, we would end up with large errors. And I was fortunate enough to have the BRE IDM, IDMP data set, so I could do that right the first time I attempted this and saw that the errors were indeed huge. And indeed, we can see why they're huge. If we look at photocell 1, and here's the daylight coefficient matrix for that, uh, that one cell, I've put a little red spot at the centre of each patch because that's where the ray goes. We're not jittering the rays by jiggling them around at all. We're sending it to the centre there. Now, we can see that point there. And so the corresponding patch, we get a high value there. So this is the total daylight coefficient, direct and indirect, but the, the direct is going to be strong at the, at the front of the room, for that photocell. So not only are we getting that high value there, but as far as this patch is concerned, it's predicting the value for this total patch unobstructed. Because yeah. if it can see the centre, it assumes the whole patch is unobstructed. So here, we're getting a high value, but it's actually it's an overestimation. If we look at this one now, that point centre just happens to be covered up by that frame bar on the window. And so we're getting here now just the reflected light, you know, the light that's got into the room and bouncing around, producing that value, when really this value should actually be bigger than this one, shouldn't it? Because this one you can only see half the patch, in, in more or less in reality, whereas here we've got almost the full patch visible, but just that centre part is missing. It's even worse at photocell 2, where we can see three patch centres out of all of those. All the rest are obscured, so we've got three high values. And if we look at it in a, in a same viewpoint but different projection, we can see why all these just happen to be obscured. So just that arrangement in the BRE, BRE room was great in that it just happened to show this, this effect up very strongly. So, <clears throat> so huge errors in the direct sky component. So if we get that wrong, we're going to be getting an awful lot of our predictions wrong. Certainly at photocell 1. Photocell 6, it's actually not so bad because at photocell 6, probably three quarters of the light is reflected and much less of it is direct. Whereas at photocell 1, close to the window, most of the light there will be direct. So huge errors, both under and over prediction. One option would be to use glow sources instead of light sources. <coughs> so now you could send multiple rays to this. It's less efficient, certainly for a whole, if you're doing it for all of the calculation, in other words, for the direct and indirect. This would be quite inefficient because you'd be sending out lots of rays, the whole hemisphere, to find that. You can direct rays to rectangular patches. I've done this with, with CAL files and things. But it's, there's a better way of doing this. Um, and this is now where we're coming into what's called a four component method. So this was uh, created to sort of uh, eliminate or at least greatly reduce the errors found in the, in the naive formulation. Uh, three daylight coefficient matrices are computed as opposed to just a single one, which was for all of the light the first time around. However, it's minimal computational overhead over the naive method. 
and we actually end up computing illuminance as four separate components, direct and indirect components each of the sun and the sky. That can actually be very useful afterwards for evaluation purposes and to get an insight into the performance of the space. The rationale, this, this actually was formulated back in 1995. Um, it was to use an unmodified version of radiance because very few people actually modify radiance code. Well, unless, unless they're called Greg Wood. Um, so I maintain the efficiency of using a light source to get light into the space. And maintain the efficiency advantage of having ambient interpolation and the overture calculation. That gives you kind of smooth results. Yeah. <coughs> uh, make use of multiple available CPUs. This is not multi-processing where you've got a single process that's split up to go. This is actually independent processes on machines. Back in 95 there was very little true multi-processing. But you did have multiple CPU machines. And it was tested against the best possible validation data set. It wasn't just sort of tested against it. Actually, having that data set guided the formation of this, the formulation of this method. So thanks to the BRE, of which we have a representative this afternoon as well as earlier on <laughs> for that, because uh, it really couldn't have happened without it. So for the direct sky component, to do it accurately, um, just have lots of light sources, not one. So here's 900 in each of the rectangular patches. 900 light sources, 755 in the polar cap, a total of 130,000 <laughs> light sources. It sounds like a lot. It happens in a blink of an eye, the, these, these simulations, yeah. Direct light source calculations very, very fast, yeah. Uh, unless you're, well, if you're dealing with points rather than pixels, we'll come to that later on. Um, having direct light sources also means that you can use this for some light redirecting materials um, that are described in CAL files like Ceraglaze or uh, pris prismatics and so forth. Also works well with uh, translucence and so forth. Um, if you've got nearly a thousand samples for any patch, then your actual sampling error for that patch is going to be less than a percent. So there's our patch visible from one of the photo cells in the BR room, but without the BR room. As soon as we put the BRE room there, we can see that we've got lots of those to sample that fractional bit of patch that we're seeing. Okay, and we can compare the results there. So if we now just got the naive method without interreflection, so we just get the direct light source, one source per patch, this is what it looks like. Again, all those values are, are identical because you either see it or you don't. And when you see it, it assumes complete visibility for that one. You have slight variation with the difference in solid angle, but very, very slight. Whereas with 900 sources per patch, we're accurately sampling each patch for partial visibility. And that's what we see. And of course, we can see our projection, or our hemispherical projection of the windows. Yeah. <coughs> now for our indirect light, actually the naive method is good for the indirect light. It's perfectly good. So what we want to do is to reuse that. So Here's what we had before, the naive method direct and indirect, with some AB greater than zero. Here's the bit which was causing the big errors, the direct component. So we just subtract that daylight coefficient from that one, and we end up with a daylight coefficient matrix for indirect light arriving at that patch, uh, sorry, that photocell point. And that is an accurate value. And you can test that by further subdividing this into more patches. And actually, you, you get barely any noticeable in improvement in accuracy. <coughs> so that is actually good and worth using. 
This is the computationally expensive part, doing the multiple bounces. Yeah. And same for the reflected light from the sun. We'll find when we come to do that, we'll take that point. Uh, there's the sun, there's the nearest patch point. So we'll use that to compute the reflected light from the sun. Whilst it's important to get the direct light from the sun accurately, in other words, we don't want to move the sun position by 7 degrees because we're going to be way out with the direct sun patch. For the interreflected light, because by definition it doesn't have that strongly directional nature, we can use this discretization for it and it works perfectly well. We can show that because we've tested it against the measurements in the BRE room. Okay, for the direct sun component, this is what you do want to get accurately. I use two schemes. I, I started off with 5,000 evenly distributed suns, but actually ended up using 2,000 most of the time. Unless you want to do something really fancy and precise, you know, like model Stonehenge and to exact, you know, five seconds of when the sun's summer solstice or so, you might want to use this. But actually 2,000 uh, suns works for most conditions. <coughs> So the full component method compute three daylight coefficient matrices, 145 direct sky patches with 900 light sources per patch, 2,000 or 5,000 direct sun points evenly distributed across the hemisphere again with AB0, and then 145 indirect sky and well also we use that for indirect sun points with one light source per patch and A, B, whatever. I don't use anything less than five, and I typically use A, B, seven. Ambient bounce is seven for that. Blindingly fast, blindingly fast. This will be the same as 145 daylight factor calculations, say. OK, accuracy. So again, validated using the BRE IDMP data set. Measured sky luminance scans. Uh, comparable accuracy to standard radiance and actually the predictions were typically within about plus or minus 10 percent of the measurements. I mean that's within the accuracy of the measurement instruments themselves so really that is actually quite jaw-dropping accuracy and we can only demonstrate that because the BRE IDMP, IDM, IDMP data set was so good to begin with. Um, so the bars to look at that's a standard calculation if you were to predict for these hundreds of skies which are in here um, <coughs> one at a time using radiance and then we've got the daylight coefficient this is all the, this refined version the different variants here I don't want to go into that too much but I did an option of using 580 patches as opposed to 145 to see what advantage there would be in describing uh, both the direct and the indirect at 580 and actually it wasn't worth the candle yeah most of the time so we can just treat these all pretty much the same you know here's plus or minus 10 percent and you know for a lighting measurement that's just light it any lighting thing it's pretty astonishing uh, rms values again here very good so oh yeah i should say these were against measured sky luminance scans yeah, so we're putting in measured sky scans to, to do this validation. The method was configured to solve for points, not pictures. So there's, there's not many climate-based analyses require pictures. Um, maybe daylight glare probability and things like that, but do you really believe any of the glare metrics? I mean, daylight, probabil daylight glare probability is the best one for sure but the simulation assumes that the head is going to be fixed in position like when you're having a hundred year you know, Degura type photo taken but your head stays fixed for the whole year in the simulation and there's that lovely study by uh, Christoph Reinhardt and Jakubiak where they allowed the simulated head to move and you got completely different simulated daylight glare probability so I'm, I'm not one for uh, uh, giving too much credibility to glare predictions at the moment because I think the simulations are some way off, off reality. So most of the time I think you don't need images for, for climate-based. Not all the time, but most. 
Um, it allows us to use arbitrary shaped sensor grids. And crucially, we're looking at thousands of points, sensor points, rather than millions. If you're producing an image, then even just a thousand by a thousand, which you know, isn't exactly high res nowadays, that's a million calculation points. Each pixel is a calculation point. Um, having thousands rather than millions means the post-process can be done um, in memory. You don't have to write to disk and continually read and write stacks and stacks of, of data, which slows things down. So the stencil method, uh, here's your sensor plane, create a radiance image of it. The actual final resolution of your grid will depend on the pixel dimensions that you give to that image. You can make those pixel dimensions large or small. And then a little radiant script will just take the sensor points. They'll get the XYZ position of each of those um, points where the uh, image is non-zero. In other words, on this point here, um, XYZ and surface normal. And then you may want to add some other sensor points, like something on the facade, something on the roof, something at the back of the room, whatever. So you just have everything as a list of points, which you then reform back into an image when you look at your data at the end. Um, parameter settings and compute time. Um, for a simple space, something like that will work. This was quite a deep plan space, so AB7. Yeah, they, again, it was a simple space, so you didn't have to go mad with these numbers. And you get a nice, smooth, accurate result because you're making use of ambient interpolation, which you can do with this approach. Even though you're doing 145 of these simulations, you can get them over with pretty quick. So for a simple space, computing the daylight coefficients took about five minutes on a 2014 iMac. So that reports as having eight cores. It's actually four physical and four virtual, but it always shows up as eight. <clears throat> you might want to do the post-process at finer than one hour, because at one point your sun patch could look like that, and one hour later it could look like that. And before anybody puts up their hand and says, yes, yes, I haven't done that, I've just flipped the image to sort of illustrate it. But it could happen, yes. And you'd miss the progression of the sun patch. So I tend to run these at, in the post-process at 15 minute intervals. Um, so the climate data is interpolated. So if you've got a sun value here, one hour and here the other, you'd interpolate 15 minutes. But in, crucially, you'd also be computing the sun position every 15 minutes. And with 2,000 um, points, pre-computed sun points, that's comparable accuracy to the time step. You need to make sure that your discretization is a resolution is commensurate with your time step because there's no point going down to a too fine time step if you always end up using the same sun position. Yeah. And if we look at the workflow, so we start off with our CAD model, here's a classroom, here's our sensor grid points, happens to be these desks. Create your radiance image, extract XYZ surface normal points from there, feed that in to the scripts that predict our three daylight coefficient matrices, direct, indirect, and the one I haven't shown is the direct sun. And then now we take our climate file and we assign a building orientation because there's nothing special about the building orientation and, and the daylight coefficient patches. Yeah? You assign the building orientation at this stage. It could just be the default value which you've got, um, or you could orientate it arbitrarily, because all that does is that tells you how you're going to put up the brightness of the patches of the sky um, into your when you're doing the post-process and where the sun will be going. Yeah. So what this means is that you can analyze your building for any climate and any orientation reusing these daylight coefficient values, the computationally expensive bit. You can keep reusing those all the time. Yeah. Um, 
And then you'll generate an illuminance time series for, with this method, you'll have four illuminance time series every 15 minutes for direct sky, indirect sky, direct sun, indirect sun. And then you can compile those into whatever metric you want, UDI, whatever. And of course, you're taking the points and at this stage, reforming those points into an image. Uh, timeline. So this actually, the full component method sort of happened around here. Uh, there was one or two little papers around here, but not many people heard about it uh, for reasons which will become obvious. Uh, DaySim, uh, I'll do a little bit about that. You'll hear a lot more about it from Eleonora in a wee while. Um, made a substantial revision here around that time. Um, Otherwise, it's been continual refinement since then. And RT Contrib, which is now, this is kind of radiance going, self going climate based, appeared in uh, 2005. Um, not a lot was heard about this at the time because uh, my day job was in Aberdeen at the Marine Laboratory and I was doing this stuff in the evening. Uh, well, whatever. The nights were long, there was little to do. Um, now, a little bit about DaySim and RT, RT Contrib. Um, <coughs> okay, uh, these are just slides taken from uh, some of Greg's presentation from 2005 Radiance Workshop. So, this is when RT Contrib was introduced. So, core radiance rendering routines, you know, recursively, that means through many light bounces and reflections and so forth, evaluate the basic unit radiance, that's why the software is called radiance. But it loses information about where the light originates from um, in this process. So prior to this version, when RT Contrib appeared, you had two solutions. You could either repeat, now I guess it's rendering because he's creating, he's mostly demonstrating this with images, uh, for each source, that's costly, that's the full component method or switch to DaySim, which stores daylight coefficients, but not all of the data that you would need if you want to model complex fenestration systems using bidirectional scattering distribution functions. More on that later on. Um, and then in 2012, um, RT Contrib, and actually it's, it, was, it was superseded by RT Contrib, our contrib, um, has to, they have to, um, it requires that ambient interpolation is switched off. So that means the technique becomes a pure Monte Carlo one and you have hemispherical sampling happening at every point. That requires a massive number of AD rays for a start to reduce the variance. But even then, you end up with quite noisy output. And so that means you often have to oversample enormously your image and then filter it down to smooth that out. So whilst um, it all happens in one go, you have to do an awful lot in, in one go. And so when I was working on the New York Times building, I actually ended up using my approach rather than the first version of RT Contrib because I found it quicker and easier to use. But that was probably just due to habit. Um, DaySim. Also does it in one go, um, and it's, I'm not quite sure how it works under the hood, but I think we need to ask Christoph Chris Reinhardt about that. Um, and RT Contrib is more general and memory efficient. This is comparing to, to DaySim. Um, <coughs> the, those values that you saw, uh, those ambient values that I, that I put up earlier, um, I can use relatively low resolution ones and get a fast, accurate solution because when you're just simulating on a sensor plane, you, you're not trying to simulate creases, the corners in a, that, you, that, you, that you would see if you're rendering a space. When you create, if you look around here, if you were to try and model this room in Radiance now, it would spend 99% of its time in the corners <laughs> of the space and all those creases because that's where the light is changing. Now, you can still you know, get a very accurate solution 
if you're just simulating for say a plane in the middle of this room by using parameters that are far too coarse to give you something smooth on the wall but will still be accurate for the surface in the middle. That's another reason yeah, to use the stencil method and, the, and sensor grids rather than simulating for the whole space. Uh, postscript. Um, now, from the, from the onset, I, I never expected that this would, this would survive. I thought it would be superseded sooner rather than later. Um, I, I didn't hide how it was done. It was all published in, in a, an interminable length in a PhD. I didn't release the software because it was because I'm a rubbish programmer and, and it, you, I didn't, there was no interface. It was all scripts and so forth. I mean, if anybody wanted to uh, you know, engineer it, yeah, they could fairly, fairly quickly. Um, no one did, and I expect that was because of DaySim, um, and that's fine. I mean, DaySim got a lot more people doing climate-based for sure. Um, at the time, I thought this whole full component method seemed kind of clunky, but I think we'll see after Eleonora's presentation and the various phase methods that you'll see that actually, well, pff, perhaps it's not so clunky. Might even have an elegance all of its own there. So, um, well, I still use it and it works very well. I've validated it so I'm comfortable with it. Um, would anyone else want to use it? I mean, the basic computational daylight coefficients, that's easy, that's all scripts. Um, the bit that actually does the post-processing, I've done that in IDL, and that's, uh, you know, you have to pay for that. So um, I don't know if that would put people off, but somebody could code that up in Python, I think, or whatever. Wouldn't take too long. So if anybody wants to, then, yeah. <laughs> Looking at you, Julie. <laughs> um, will it do BSDFs? I, I'm not entirely sure. It'll certainly be fine for some light redirecting material, especially where you've got a, a good cal file description. Um, oh, bidirectional scattering distribution function. Okay. You'll see more on that. That's a description where, um, well, we say complex fenestration system, but even the simplest thing there, a Venetian blind, is actually horribly complex optically, mm -hmm. and you need this. But actually, I'm not a big fan of trying to compute light through Venetian blinds because you know, it just takes a little tweak and the optical properties are completely changed. So it's a bit of an academic exercise and a practical one. Um, I actually don't know yet about BSDFs. I suspect it might work for some, if it does, but probably not all. Um, we'll find out. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, hold on to your hats. What happens next? So this was all the easy stuff, actually. This was, we, did it this way because with the full component method, I think it, it gives you a good idea of how daylight coefficients work because it's a much more transparent process than what happens with all of these phase methods and so forth. Okay, so any, just take a, a, just a couple of minutes if anyone wants to get some tea or coffee or anything like that or any, any quick questions. We'll have some more at the end. Any questions now? Yeah, a few people. Yeah, yeah. It's not top secret or anything like that. It's just sort of, you know. Um, it, I just always thought it was an interim thing, but actually, most of the time you're simulating for fairly standard glazing types, and it works perfectly well for that. And translucence, it worked well for translucence. Okay, so we'll just take a couple of minutes then, hand over while we. Um, and I certainly need a cup of tea. Thank you. <laughs>